All right. You hear me? You hear me? Okay. Well, hello. My name is Sergio. I'm very glad he pronounced my family name well. I mean, it's Tupinian. It's Tupinian. I, I, got, I had to get rid of the Ny, you know. Uh, basically, I come from the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and I'm very, very thrilled to be here with you to share you my research. I'm a um, second year PhD student at the University of Geneva, and uh, my research is about the fine grained evaluation of the interactive nerve experience. Okay, many things to talk about here. So, just a little bit about me, just um, who I am. So, as I said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Geneva. Oops. I also co organize the games meetup of the university. So, every two weeks, um, we get together, we play video games between 12.30 and 1.30. So, we also have lunch while someone is presenting, which is Kind of nice. uh, we try to see games like uh, also like not only from the fun perspective, but try to see if there's any kind of application in terms of learning, uh, education. Like we try to analyze and document what we what, what basically students and volunteers present. Um, a bit of a background: I have a master's in media engineering for education. I actually have three masters. I got a master from France, another one from Portugal and Spain. It was an European program. Um, during my grad school, I worked with the virtual reality and EEG, so I tried to assess attention of students in virtual reality environments by creating this kind of prototype of um, low-cost EEG for assessing um, EEG, which is the, the kind of uh, device you use for uh, measuring the act electrical activation of the brain cortex. So a bit of neuroscience as well. Um, after that, well, before that, I did my bachelor in computer science in Colombia and France. So I am also, uh, professionally speaking, I've been working as a developer, a bit of in-learning, and I have the chance to work in many countries so far. So I live in Switzerland, this is my seventh country. But I, before that, I've um, worked in Colombia, in France, in the US, Germany, and Algeria. So a bit of <laughs> all around the world. Um, I'm from Colombia. Uh, I love cycling, as you can see here. That's Switzerland. Uh, you're invited to come. And I also like tennis, and of course, as we probably all here, we all, I, like, I love video games. So um, I would like to start my presentation by bringing to the table this natural opposition that exists between narrative and play, between story and interactivity. So these two elements are often regarded as inversely proportional. So if you push into the story side, you might lose a lot of interactivity. Or if you push a lot into the interactivity, well, you might lack a bit of narrative itself, right? So there is a, there is a natural, uh, this natural uh, opposition, and this is a huge debate between ludologists and narratologists on how can we do this, and of course many game, many game companies are trying to push, to kind of uh, get these two at the same level, or trying to bridge the two of them. So is it possible to bridge these two uh, elements? Well, one of the solutions to this um, problematic or this debate is the field of interactive digital storytelling. So in interactive digital storytelling, what we want is to pursue the vision of really, of making the experience of narratives truly interactive by letting users um, make meaningful decisions, for instance, by influencing the fate of a character in a video game, and so co-creating the story. Uh, in short, this interactive digital storytelling field is a medium where the narrative and its evolution can be influenced in real time by a user. This is a definition by Portius, Cavazza, and Charles in 2010. And in pop culture, we have this example of the holodeck, I would say hololens, holodeck of Star Trek as the ideal model of interactive narrative. So this is what we all try to push from this kind of um, vision. Of course, that not only from the, this is from most, mostly from an academic perspective, but of course, many companies I know are, try, are trying to go that direction as well. Uh, interactive drama is one of the branches of uh, interactive digital storytelling. Basically, it's a combination of autonomous characters drama management uh, to create this first person, so from the viewpoint of the, of the user, story worlds. Um, some simple, some example systems that were, have been created, mostly from an um, um, academic perspective. Well, you have FACET, which is probably, does anyone here knows about FACET? Some of you, so you know the kind of experience I'm talking about. There is, there is the social relations, conflict and drama as core mechanics. So it is, basically this game is about um, you're a close friend to the couple, and depending on how you uh, interact in the game, they either end up loving or, or hating each other. And you will see a lot of videos on YouTube on how people try to break the algorithms to make crazy things with them. So yeah, check on that. That's very, very fun to see. Um, so there is a, a collection of coordinated um, character behaviors, behaviors, what we call the story beats. 
and there is a drama manager that reprograms um, the simulation so give it, to give it a, a bit of overall narrative uh, experience. Narrative shape, sorry. So, the facade, there's also another system called Fear Not, which is, this one deals with the topic of bullying in school settings, so trying to put you from the perspective of, of another like, person or a student that has this kind of problem, so another kind of interactive storytelling uh, system. Um, that's, that's so, basically, there, there, have been, there, there are many systems around, but what we kind of identify, there are two main categories. You have the, we have the coarse grain systems, um, category and the fine grain systems category. So these two categories are different since on the coarse grain systems the users intervene at the, at the scene level and as I said those scenes are the basic story for uh, basic unit for story management and these units have an autonomous, autonomous meaning and then uh, there is uh, well some rules for ordering these narrative bits, so these scenes. Uh, so there's a lot of authoring involved but still a lot of uh, open-ended uh, endings. And on the other side, we have the fine-grained systems where the users intervene at the action level, and it is the role of the system actually to, to assemble, to organize these actions so that they constitute a more coherent uh, inter and interesting story. Uh, so the sequence of events in fine-grained um, systems are generated by a system, again, and so they're more interactive, but they're perceived to be less engaging. Again, this is perception. There are no data that can back up what I'm saying right now. But this, there is a big difference between playing, uh, playing like facade and playing fear not. Like you, you, from the way the, the game was done, you can see that there are two different approaches. So this is the definition we came. This is the classification we came up with. Um, this particular presentation, I will talk to you about the fine grained systems approach because they are kind of the, the system that need more attention from the academic and the industry as well. Um, for, for improvement. There's more, more to be improved on this side than the other, on the other side, basically. So, these fine-grained systems um, use the notion of narrative acts, what we call the narrative acts. Those are those building blocks that are used in the generation of narrative, complex narrative events. Um, so, uh, these narrative acts correspond to what the users are saying to the system when they're interacting with a narrative. Um, for instance, we have one narrative <coughs> act here called inform, so we have character X that informs character Y, and there's a predicate. There's another narrative act called refuse to help. Again, here's another logic. That character X refuses to help character Y to reach G. G is a goal. And there is another a narrative act here called congratulate character X, congrat congratulates character Y for having performed A. A is an action. So there are many, many narrative acts out there, and basically um, we did this. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful image. It doesn't look very pretty, but it's, 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 the idea was that we tried to went through literature and through the system that implement this notion of narrative acts. We came up with, with 214 different narrative, narrative acts that you can find here. Um, so there is a domain level, there is a um, classes level, but basically there's a classification that came, we came up with. We did this work last year, and the idea was to also, like, to to get the work of those structuralist authors like Grey Master, Dorof, um, Bremont, and some systems that implement this notion of narrative acts like Seaboot, Facade, etc. So this is the first classification that we came up with. Uh, but we wanted this, to, this is like so plain, we, so like there is no way to interact with this. This was just a visualization. So this year we were lucky enough to have one master student that helped us to build this tool. This is an interactive catalog of narrative acts. You can check it out in this URL if you want to. Um, and basically, we, we tried to use this uh, as an author tool that could be used uh, to, for, for generation of story world. So authors can say, hey, we'd like to implement this agree to deal narrative act or whatever they want. So it's more like giving them ideas on how to uh, basically think of their, their interactive uh, narratives. So just coming back to the topic of my presentation, just uh, now, what, what, is, what is the problem here? Well, these systems, these interactive digital storytelling systems, they produce what we call the interactive narrative experience. And this interactive narrative experience is different from regular uh, user experience or whatever, since the author, the users, and the machine, they all participate in the story comp creation process, story composition process. And the problem is that there is very few research on 
focus on empirically evaluating this interactive narrative experience. There are many uh, notions and theories, but not much data that can back up or can say, hey, this is what characterizes this. Um, our problem is that this kind of systems, there might be different in each execution since the user has a real impact on the actual narrative deployment. So how can we um, det um, characterize this? So we had to look at how <coughs> basically we're doing user research on this kind of systems. So there is regular um, system like Facade or Cboot or any other system you have. You make, this, um, you make the users play the systems for a while. So you make them experience the system. And after this, well, you stop the execution of the game or you plan for you know, 20, 10, 20 minutes, et cetera. And then you ask them uh, about their experience. So it's a, a posteriori approach, which works fine for, for assessing or for understanding the like, general things and general issues. But what we think here is that here in the narrative, interactive narrative experience, this temporal resolution is very important since this is what actually makes this different from other user experience. Or it, 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 we're not, not all the users go through the same narrative path. They, are diff they, they may have different experience at the end. So these temporal um, variations were for us what we wanted to get through. So we wanted to analyze in a fine grain the interactive narrative experience. Why? Well, because in, the, in, this, in this field, it is relevant to know which part of a story elicits certain experiences. And also, as we all know, uh, narrative systems are growing their capacities, so you have more capable narrative systems today, thanks to the AI explosion. But we still need a, um, a, well, a set of well-designed evaluation methods that can actually tell us more about what's going on during the experience and not just like afterwards. So this is actually the motivation of, of our work. So what we propose here is an evaluation framework um, for basically characterizing um, in a very fine, fine grain level the interactive narrative experience. And this presentation is gonna be about the data that such framework can provide. So this is just, just to frame the, the expectation now. We're, we're going to, to, to show the data that we, I'm going to show you the data that we can get from applying this evaluation framework. So, uh, this is a very famous phrase by Baiko Matias. So you have to build sometimes, you have to build it to understand it. So, we had this task of creating an experimental game that was um, necessary also for theoretical advances and progress. So, we had to build it and we did it. So, this is the game we came up with. It's now called Nothing for Dinner. It is a game about a teenager that has to deal, well, with dinner first, because there is nothing for dinner. And you also have to take care of your parent here, your dad, he suffered a traumatic brain injury, so you have to make him take the pills, you have to make people cooperate, you have your sister Lily, who is kind of not always very helpful. So you have to get through your, this, this could be a regular daily life in, in this kind of um, scenario, living with a parent with a problematic uh, um, injury, let's say. So this is what the late game looks like. As you can see here in the top, you can see the, the actions that are dynamically generated. The number may change from time to time. So this is how it looks like. You select narrative act. This is all dynamically generated, actually. So you tell your dad that, please take your medicine. Uh, you know, it's what the doctor said. And your dad normally says, he's, he's trying like, don't annoy me with this, pills, they're re that's really nonsense. And you have to get your way through that. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes. We, when we are evaluating this game, we, we notice that users are easily <laughs> frustrated. But uh, as you can see, the numbers can change. Um, there is, um, the idea is that you have to get your way through um, by asking help, by accepting help from others, by um, delegating, delegating actions and delegating tasks. So basically, the whole, this is the whole setting of the game that we are using for uh, actual evaluation of the interactive narrative experience. And uh, you can also uh, play the game if you want. It is available in this in this URL here. So um, my, the big question here, the research question was like, is there a relationship between the narrative, narrative act, so these building blocks that we are using for the generation of, of stories and the player engagement? Uh, so is there anything that we can um, correlate and we can actually check for uh, actually if, if what, are there some building blocks that are more meaningful or more relevant to the users for the case of interactive narrative? So that's the question that guided our work. And so 
we wanted to understand player engagement, and of course, as we all know, engagement is a very far-reaching uh, concept. It's often associated with um, motivation, enjoyment, flow, immersion, etc. But the claim that Henrik Schonaufok from the University of Aalborg in Denmark, he, he, he made is that all these concepts, they all lead to the willingness to continue an experience. So this is the, the actual continuation desire approach. So it is not engagement, it is an indicator of engagement, actually. So by using the approach of Henrik Schonaufok, we can get an engagement curve so we can sample in-game what are the actual, um, actual the quantifications of how much they want to continue playing. And also we can assess the narrative since we are asking them like, what do they want to do next in the game and uh, what makes you want or not want to continue playing. So this is the, the framework that he proposed. It is suitable for interactive narratives. Uh, we, that's what we implemented. So um, this, is the, this is a bit of a description. The framework that we propose has two aspects. So one is the self-reported data. We have the continuation desired data. The, the questionnaires as well, we're not telling that questionnaires are not important. We're, we're just saying that they're not, they're by themselves, they're not necessary. So we are coming again with triangulation because we are also um, interested in the effective component. Effect, the effective component is super important to understand also how users are perceiving the, this, these narratives that are being generated. So these three, three elements here are self-reported, and of course we have the telemetry. Um, this is what we call the deep logs, because it's not just about like, taking into account what they did in our order logic, but we also have all the, all the calculations from the narrative engine that can tell us many things about the choices that were presented, how users behave, and so on, so on. So this is what we call the deep logs. And this is the actual architecture that we came up with for implementing this. So we are using a crowdsourcing approach, so um, we are getting our users online using this service, which is prolific. We could use any other service. And then we have, um, of, co of course, we get demographic data and all, the, all other um, information from here. And then we here in the survey system, which is also already in the University of Geneva, we ask them about um, their gaming profile and other data that afterwards, it's, um, of course, this is all registered in a database. And then we have the game engine and the narrative engine that communicate and then we, at the end we have the whole big picture of what's going on and what's the, the interactive narrative experience by implementing this. So as I talk to you, we are interrupting users. And the question is when to interrupt users. Is there a good moment to interrupt users? You may say yes, you may say no. I mean, it depends on, on your approach. According to our, our approach, we, um, we said that we, we didn't want them to be interrupted in, time, in fixed time intervals. We said we can come up with an algorithm that can trigger some dynamic interruptions. So the way it works, we are basically waiting for a user-initiated action. And once it's completed, so once the user sees the effect of this user-initiated action on the world, that could be a candidate for interruption. And of course, we have other um, levers or other uh, variables that we are introducing in, this, in our algorithm to make it like, to, to adapt it to, our, to your own study. So you can parameter all these variables here if you want to, be, to have more space, uh, space interruptions, for instance. Uh, what this is giving us, and this is just fast forward to the results, uh, we have an interruption every, let's say, three minutes, but they're not on, all in the same moment. They're, like, you can see the distribution here. They're triggered differently according to their logic. So in our study, we use these values, but you can use other values for if you want like, <coughs> longer expositions. Uh, to the, of users to your game. This is what the interactions look like. So, as you can see, there is, they are still seeing the, the, the world, so it's not like we are popping, pop, uh, showing a pop-off and, oh, I don't remember what I was doing. Like, no, we are trying to integrate it into the, into the actual game uh, using the same mechanics, the same ideas. Um, so here we ask them to quantify their continuation desire from this, using a Likert scale. And here we try to uh, ask them about the, the narrative itself, so what makes you want to continue. And then um, th this approach uh, give us in three different points, uh, or four, or one, or two, depending on your study, the, 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 this, this temporal uh, information that we actually need. And not f just from a uh, from narrative uh, perspective, we also have the emotional self-reporting at every interruption, since the emotions matter. We, we believe that emotions should be also like, part of this interactive narrative experience. So in the preview, before the study, they are briefed on this um, pleasure allows and dominance model. 
So they have to click on their image. That, this is a cross-validated tool, so they kind of, it's very intuitive to use. So you click on the, on the image that best represents how they're feeling, and you can use this information to build uh, this octants of temperance space that can be afterwards mapped into emotional uh, effect state. So you can get this data, from this data you can kind of understand what, how they're, they're feeling at a particular moment. So, sorry, I have to rush because there are many things to talk about. I don't want to be over time. So the study one that we used for actually seeing if all these beautiful things work, uh, we recruited 54 uh, users, again using crowdsource approach. Um, and then, okay, they were aged 17 to 40, the average age was 28. Uh, they, we made them play for around 10 minutes, uh, our game, and then the, um, the whole experience lasted for around 17 minutes. Uh, here are the results, the, the data you can get of this approach. So first thing you can see here, well, this is the actual gameplay log. So you, in yellow, you, in orange, sorry, you have the player actions, and in blue you have the computer actions. So you have the actions that were triggered, these are the narrative acts that we have. And this is actually the, the, the evolution of, of the experience. Um, as you can see, there are many metrics here. This is the number of choices, the global score, the progression, motivation, ethics, conflict. So the, the, this, is how the, this is how the narrative engine reasons. So for instance, uh, when the, there is a ethic, negative ethic option, but there is a high motivation, there is a conflict, for instance. So there are many, many logic that actually the narrative engine take, take into account. And you can use these deep logs to explore metrics like the choice range, which is how many choices the player and the computer had in average for each turn. And also the choice variability, oh, yeah, which is how many choices were new compared to all the previous um, options that were presented. So you can check again these metrics. But they also the, the interesting part is the, the actual interruptions. So we can, have, we can tie those interruptions in time. We can know that here there was an interruption, here as well, here as well. And at this point, we can quantify and qualify the engagement according also, we can take into account what happened during the game. So this is um, the engagement, in-game in engagement sampling. We have three interruptions, you know. So interruption one, two, three. We can see that here, this is a kind of a U-shaped uh, engagement curve. And what's interesting here is that we ask them, how, what do you want to do next in the game? So in, for interruption one, we have this value of, of engagement and we have the actual data, the actual uh, feedback that users are giving us. And we also ask them, we have the information about what makes you want or not want to continue playing. So we have, we can tie all this information with the deep logs and also with the, um, with the effective information to get a bigger and better defined picture of what's going on. So just to show you some results, um, basically here in interruption number one, they said, okay, we want to make dinner, we also want to talk to our NPCs. Um, I want to give the pills to my dad, or check the fridge, whatever. And interruption number two, of course, we see that there is a, we, we can understand that the, the, the game switched towards making dinner, you have to make dinner. And other tasks are, are really like, they, they don't give a much importance, they really want to make dinner and that's, that's the whole case. But the cool thing about this approach, that we, not, we have this information that we can tie up with the, with the actual motivations to want or not want to continue playing. So we know that here they're experiencing curiosity motivation, um, frustration boredom is not like high, but then we get some values that are changing here for interruption number two, and at the end they are kind of frustrated bored, and we know that they, they are not getting this task done. So we can, like over time, understand even though everyone play, plays differently and the, and the system reacts differently, what's going on in, in game. Okay, s some applications about this, this approach. Well, first of all, you can have a model of the user, uh, you can um, update and improve actually the model of the user based on the collected info, so you know what's the status of your, of your user at some point. You can make some predictions based on the, on the actual um, user initiated act actions and accomplishments with continuation desire, so you can predict in, uh, the nature, you can predict actually the, the level of continuation desire based on the nature of the runtime events. Or you can improve a core narrative engine because you, all with this information you can um, actually help him to be make better orchestration of narrative acts, events, and narrative structure, pacing, difficulty, etc. It's a bit like the, like the director in Left 4 Dead, so he learns from you. And of course we have the, some design guidelines that, that you can use for, the authors and, and designers can use for improving their systems because they know how the users are experiencing them. 
Um, another kind of another set of data that we have, we have the acceptance, which is a very important um, dimension in interactive narrative. It's basically the, the, um, the users being recognizing that they have a causal effect in the world. In the case of our game, it was, uh, they agree a little, so it's not so strong. They, we have some work to do here. And we have some other dimensions, such as replayability, the initial intention versus the, the, the replayability intention, and some basic usability questions that we can ask them for also understanding what's going on. OK, um, so I would like to conclude, if I want time, yeah. Um, that this approach that we are presenting here, it actually can be used to quant quantify and qualify the interactive narrative experience. So we have the in-game in -game engagement that it's being measured. Uh, we can track the narrative evolution like, with, with the questions and the actions that users play. The dynamic con conditional interruptions, they seem to work fine so far. So um, they, they are per kind of perceived possibly, well not possibly, it's like they're, they're not perceived negatively at least. Uh, they can be easily customized depending on your study, the length of your, of your uh, yeah, how, how, how often do you want them to appear. So this can be, this is a, also a, a research area that we can uh, dig further. Um, the, if the interruptions, the, the effect, negative effect of the interruptions can be minimized by using the existing game mechanics and of course the non-masking interface because as you saw we are not totally um, masking the, the game, the state of the world. The crowdsourcing works for our case, so we got rapidly and honest data connection. Uh, they were, the users re responded like very quickly, and of course we got a lot of feedback and honest feedback. So they don't they don't want to please you because no, you, they really kind of are mean to you. That's what I'm my experience at least. And of course the emotions matter. We we really think that the emotional aspects should be um, should be should be taken into account, especially because it has an impact of cognitive resources. And you can read the Hart Peckron's work on this, it's, it is very important. So we, we are also um, advocating for emotional um, evaluation in these kind of experiences. Next step in our research, well, we are going to, going to use a no um, a control group with no interruptions. We're going to, of course, uh, use the crowdsource approach. So we can compare the effect of interruptions. Uh, we are also exploring with psychophysiological data that will be on site in Geneva using uh, galvanic skill response, facial expressions, trying to see if we can further advance on this um, objective um, emotional re reporting, or yeah, emotional um, <coughs> assessment. Because we think, and uh, we share this view, that the non-intrusive assessment of in-game <coughs> continuation desire could be used to orchestrate events in order to keep the player engaged in the narrative. So this is the way we, are, we, are, we, we kind of want to go through. So at the end, we might probably need to, to interrupt the user. We can know if they are feeling these emotional components. They are, they are kind of experiencing the, the, the interaction in a better way. So that would be the, the great idea to see these building blocks are kind of, for this application, they have this uh, emotional or, or, or uh, assessment from the user. OK, <laughs> so thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Dankov. He did the, co the talk coach. Uh, yeah, thank you for paying attention. Thanks. Do we have any questions, please? Hands nice and high. Hey, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting um, technique, certainly. There's a puzzlement I've got about how you can interpret the results when pe everyone's kind of in their own stream. So that's like maybe something for the analytics bods in, mm. the, in the room, because it's difficult to, com you can tell how a person is reacting at a particular moment given all the paths that have gone into where they are, but the comparability, for, so from an analytic point of view, it's quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, do you, you have ideas about how to approach that or how would you approach that? Yeah, so the, the thing we're trying to do here is to, as we, we have to make assumptions at some point, so we are assuming that some narrative acts that we are sampling because the interruptions are triggered after a user initiates this action. This action is a narrative act. So one of the one of the ways to go through this problem is to say, okay, this narrative act that we are sampling here has this um, this value. So we can kind of see. We can use. We're trying to explore actually. This, this is not a definite answer. So we can say this this act that was triggered, that was measured in this this way, 
we, we can characterize it that way, or we can characterize the batch, actually the, the, all the actions that were played until the interruption was triggered. So yeah, there's a lot of analytics to, done here, to be done here to, to establish clusters. Probably this combination of narrative acts have a better effect. We don't know yet. We're trying to explore that, that way, how to actually get to a more like, deep conclusions on, on the, on the actual, at the action level. If it's context-free, then it's okay, but it probably is. Exactly. That, that's, that's the problem. That's the actual problem that we are, we're facing. Yeah, a lot. Thank you. Questions for Sergio? Okay, I have a question. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah. Um, you added to your uh, additional work, looks at biometrics. I'm mm -hmm. interested uh, in, firstly, what you're hoping to get from those additional measures, and perhaps even why you're looking specifically at those two biometric measures in particular. Why are we? Yeah, so the GSR, and yeah. was it fatal? Uh, well, facial? because, yeah, the facial expression and GSR, because yeah. um, in our view, we are kind of making these interruptions as less invasive as possible. Mm -hmm. So by using the uh, bracelet and by interpreting the face ex facial expressions, probably we, we are getting a lot of informa emotional information without kind of being, or making them use an EEG mm -hmm. headset, or we're, we're exploring these two um, sources. Mm -hmm to see how they kind of correlate with the continuation desire in-game. So that's why we're, we're using these two, because they're less invasive, let's say, for the user, from the user's perspective. Interesting. I, I wondered if you had any thoughts on how you're going to present that information back to the developers. Do you have a visualization in mind, or some particular manner in which you're going to present it? Yeah, the, the idea would be, of course, to, 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 to tell uh, designers of interactive nar narratives that these narrative acts were perceived as arousing or more um, with, with, like with the emotional components as well as the, as, as the yeah, the, the idea would be to characterize either a, a narrative act or a combination of narrative acts and tell them, okay, users are experiencing this this way. So that, that would be the way to go. Like just tell them like visualization or data back to how to actual um, act was experienced. Wonderful. Ah, yes, second and first. So, uh, on the three uh, points you sampled the users, I noticed that early on there were some u users in your study which were frustrated early in the game. I was wondering if you uh, done further work into seeing what correlated with driving early frustration in this case, or you've done that, whether, for instance, uh, the narrative acts that are to do with conflict are related to early frustration, or ones that are emotionally charged are related to uh, early frustration. Mm -hmm. So, the way we, I mean, frustration doesn't necessarily have to be something um, I mean, in our, in our case, frustration is not a negative thing at the end because we, 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 there are some positive things that we can get out of frustration. We, we all, in game history, we know that frustration is not necessarily something negative. So, um, we, we, for the moment, we are trying to get the big picture and also the fine grain detail. So, at the end, we, don't, we still don't know how, how the heuristics will be, like how we, they will look like. Of course, there is, there is uh, frustration early in the game that we know because of the data we, that we collected. Um, it depends on the actual author of the story world if you intend that to happen at that point or if it's too early for, for let's say, the narrative um, structure. Or, yeah, so we, we're still, we still don't know if that's, it depends on, we have to talk to the, the actual uh, author and developer and say, okay, this is where the user experience, is this something that you intend them to, to evoke in them, actually? I'll do one more question, if I may. Yep. Do you have a feeling uh, or a sense of the type or particular type of genre, or if they, this process lends itself to a particular, particular type of narrative experience, maybe it's a particular emotion or something like that? Do you feel it could be applied equally to all types of narrative experience? I think the framework itself could be applied to interactive narrative in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the case for, I mean, we are specifically, specifically targeting a dramatic, uh, like this kind of, uh, as you can see, facade and this game—they're all like they are based on a home or family simulation. So we, we are, with, we think at least in the for being like fair in the scientific part, we are we kind of can say this works in this context. Probably we have to do more games, more other kind of. We're, we're actually developing a new, a new game right now, that's also in a family setting, but different kind of like it's called Gothic Girl. I cannot tell anything else. If my supervisor <laughs> tells me. But yeah, we also try to, to maintain the <laughs> But the, the idea is that we are really trying to understand if this, this can be extrapolated to other applications other than, I mean, other con narrative content, actually. 
facing the emotions. Yeah. Um, how do you distinguish between the emotions that the story is creating and the emotion that comes from the experience of the player? Like, if you're taking, I'll take like a very drastic example, but if we were evaluating a horror game, mm -hmm. you, you can have frustration that comes from the experience because the player is struggling with the controls or something, and mm -hmm. you have also the emotion that comes from from the game itself and the story of what's happening. So. Mm -hmm. How, how would you go about making that dis distinction when you have to do your analysis? Mm, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, so the, the idea would be to separate the, the, if I understood well, the emotions, like intentionally produce, that an author wants to evoke um, from the actual intentions that are felt by the user. Is that the, the, the way you, or I, I'm trying to understand the question, sorry, I'm not. Well, true, exactly. That, that, that's, a, that's, that's the point. Um, if, if we're trying to also, as, as you saw, we are addressing usability issues. So we are trying to get them to give us feedback on the actual usability things that they could have explored. And that's how frustration could be probably, we can detect if there's, it's more related to the actual controls of the, of, or the computers or the, I don't know, depending on, of the, on the runtime of the experience. We don't know that yet. So that's why we try to gather as much information as possible, trying to know to, not to drown in data, because of course that's another problem. But I think that by asking them different, like in, in, in different points and also by, by using other like usability tests, effectance, and this kind of other dimensions, we can probably pinpoint that this emotion goes, is more related to the actual usability problems or, or rather than the actual narrative that it's been experienced. Yeah, so it, it is, we still don't, I mean, I don't have an, an exact answer, but I, I will go that way, actually. Hi. Um, Hi. Actually, that was my question as well. <laughs> so I was going to ask about usability. Uh, so let me ask another question then. Yeah, sure. Uh, still about usability. So, because of course, the usability will impact in some yeah. way the mm -hmm. experience. Um, so for the next steps, maybe the next game, or I don't know if you're still testing on that mm -hmm. one. Uh, do you have any? Um, I mean, do you have any plans of maybe separating the study in two parts? Like first, you you'd actually tackle the usability issues and then yeah. test the narrative experience. Yeah, we're actually thinking of implementing uh, because, as you saw, we're inter we're implementing the system usability scale, the SUS, a, a three three point three question scale, which is probably not enough. So we might use attractive for other scales to kind of get more of a more information related to usability issues. So yeah, we, we, we were talking about, we we're thinking about doing this, like, not just using the SUS, but also getting something else with like attract data or other, other scales that are validated for that purpose. Hmm. All right, any more for any more? Wonderful, thank you, Sergio. Thank you.